Good morning. All right, how many of you are enjoying the weather? Is anybody missing winter? All right, we're going to pray for you because you, I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm excited to introduce our speaker to you today. We have Dr. Paul Chitwood. He serves as the president of the International Mission Board. Now, some of you may not know what the International Mission Board is, but this is an agency that sends missionaries literally all over the world. It's one of the most important agencies anywhere in the world because this is part of the extension to reach the Great Commission, fulfill the Great Commission. And so I want you all just to add Dr. Paul Chitwood and the International Mission Board to your prayer list. I want you to listen today as we have invited him to come. How many of you have gone or are planning to go on a mission trip here with Cedarville? Give me a shout out. Raise your hands. We're, all right. Some of you need to go on more mission trips. Some of you need to get involved with the International Mission Board. And obviously, you can talk to Dr. Bowman, Dr. Bennett, more about those type things as well. Uh, but we're excited to have Dr. Paul Chitwood here, president of the International Mission Board. Let me pray. Then we'll sing and worship through music, and then we'll worship through the word. Dear Lord, as we come today, I do pray that you would help just to focus our minds on the world, to focus our minds on lostness. Lord, I pray that you would help us to recognize that we all have the great commission issued to us, that we all are to be part of expanding your kingdom. Lord, that we have the good news. Lord, we understand that there is grace and forgiveness at the cross, and would you make us passionate to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ with others? Would you help us to know how we should get involved in your great plan to take the gospel to the nations so that your kingdom could expand? Lord, would you help us to give you the praise that you are worthy and deserving of today through music? And help us, Lord, to listen to what the Spirit may be saying to us through your word, through your servant today, as we seek to have you glorified in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand together.
I'll join that and say an amen. Thank you to the worship team. You guys do a fantastic job. Uh, thank you, Dr. White, for uh, the privilege of uh, allowing me to be here today and having uh, this time in chapel. It's great to be with uh, each of you. And I know there's a lot going on in the world today. I'm not just talking about spring come early, although that's already been acknowledged. Uh, not just talking about, what do we have, uh, 118 minutes left, uh, or no, it's a, an hour and 48 minutes left for you to uh, fill out that NCAA tournament bracket before the noon deadline. Uh, so lots going on in our world today. Certainly stepping back from that, and looking across the world, there's a lot going on today. Uh, two weeks ago yesterday, I was on the border of Ukraine watching busload after busload of almost exclusively women and children, the children outnumbering, outnumbering uh, the moms and the grandmoms uh, who were coming through a checkpoint on the border of Ukraine into Poland. I was there because uh, the organization that I serve with, the International Mission Board, is about the business of bringing help and hope around the world, about the business of meeting hurting people where they are and helping them along the way. It's a lot of hurting people pouring out of Ukraine, millions upon millions of them. We're trying to leverage the resources of, of the churches that uh, I work with, Southern Baptist churches, uh, to bring help to them and, and to bring hope to them. Uh, it's a very, very emotional uh, to watch this unfold and certainly to see the, uh, the pain and the despair and the trauma on the faces of those who were fleeing for their lives uh, was an emotional thing. Um, just a few days into the war at that point, uh, Russia was meeting more resistance, I think, than they had planned on. It wasn't going as they intended for it to go. And my fear at that point was what is obviously unfolding today as they're attempting to wipe Ukraine from the face of the earth. This creates incredible needs in the lives of millions upon millions of people displaced within the country and those millions displaced outside of the country the need for a place to sleep, the need for a meal, the need for shelter and for safety. And yet, even of those who are in the midst of this war, we know that's not the greatest need. The greatest need of anyone who is sheltering now from bombs in Ukraine is the greatest need that you have and that I have. It's the greatest need of the world. Because for all of the world's problems, whether those problems come in the forms of bombs or hunger or being a refugee or having an organic chemistry test staring you in the face tomorrow. For all of the world's problems, there is one problem that rises above every other problem. What is the greatest problem in our world today? Asking you that question, what comes to your mind? Let me share with you what I believe is the greatest problem in our world. The world's greatest problem is lostness. For all of the other horrific problems that we face in our world and that I pray and trust you want to be a part of the solution for, 
The greatest problem is the problem of being separated from God because of sin. It's a universal problem. It has eternal consequences, and that's why it is the greatest problem. But thank God there is a solution. And that solution is God's love that gave his only begotten son and the son who bore the price of our sin, who defeated our greatest problem and was raised from the dead. Simply, the solution to the world's greatest problem is the gospel. We have the opportunity to share that gospel, to bring help and eternal hope so those who maybe even face hell on earth can know that eternal hell is not their destination, but that heaven will be their eternal home. Do you believe heaven will be better than earth? I'm convinced heaven will be better than earth. Uh, there's no pandemic in heaven. <laughs> there are no wars in heaven. There are no presidential elections in heaven. Thank God. <laughs> heaven is better than earth. Did you know there's no depression in heaven? There's no addiction in heaven. There are no overdose deaths in heaven. There are no deaths at all in heaven because heaven, well, it's heaven. This morning, we have the opportunity to peer into heaven, to see God's great plan and solution to the world's greatest problem. And in looking into heaven, I think we find a great reminder of why we're still here on earth. Revelation 7, verses 9 and 10 are a unique uh, passage of Scripture because it is one of those places in the Bible, a few places, but one of those places in the Bible where we're literally able to see into heaven. If you're familiar with the book of Revelation, then you'll recall that John, its author, was a follower of Jesus, that John was one who preached the gospel. John was one who was persecuted for preaching the gospel. John was imprisoned for preaching the gospel. It was from his prison cell that God began to reveal things to John through visions, and those visions being recorded in the book of Revelation, not just John's word, but God's word to us. And, and we find in chapter 7, verses 9 and 10, a vision of heaven. John remarks, after this I looked, and behold a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. What an incredible thing. Could you imagine? <laughs> to be able to peer into heaven as John was able to do. And yet we're afforded that privilege in a sense today because we have that vision recorded for us in God's word. And so we're able to look into heaven today and able to see a vision that God gave to John and God has given to us to help us understand God's solution to the world's greatest problem and the reason we're here. To flesh that out, I want to invite you to ask some questions with me today of, of this vision of heaven. The first question I would challenge you to ask with me today is, who, who, who does John see in the vision? Now, John notes who is in heaven. I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could count, no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages. Do you ever wonder who will be in heaven? John tells us who will be in heaven. 
As he does so, he makes clear to us that heaven is inclusive. Now, heaven's not inclusive in the sense that everyone's included. Unfortunately, that's not the case. The Bible says, in fact, that none of us deserve to go to heaven. But because of God's great love for us, he has made that possible. As Jesus came and died for our sin, and those who have placed their their trust in him and what he did and his death and his resurrection. We call that faith. Those who have, who have turned from their sin and turned to Jesus as their Savior, we call that repentance. Those who have confessed him as Lord because he is, they'll be in heaven. But we know that many have heard that very simple message and true message, the message of the gospel, and they've rejected it. They've refused to believe it's true. They won't be in heaven. And then there are those who have heard that message and they would consent, yes, that's, that's true, it's probably true, and yet they have been unwilling to turn from their sin and trust Jesus as a Savior. They have been unwilling to surrender their life and follow Jesus as Lord. They won't be in heaven. And then there are those millions, even billions of people who have never heard the gospel. Of the nearly 12,000 people groups that have been numbered around the world, there are yet 3,000 people groups that remain unengaged with the gospel. What does it mean to be unengaged with the gospel? Well, uh, in the simplest terms, it means that uh, this coming Sunday, the first official day of spring, there's nowhere uh, that a person in that people group could go to church and hear the gospel preached because there's no church in their community. It's very unlikely that Walking down the street today, whether they're in the northern or southern hemisphere, whether it's uh, coming on spring or uh, coming on fall, it's very unlikely that they could walk through their community, their town, their city, their village, and, and run into a, a missionary who is there to share the gospel with them because the missionaries, by and large, haven't made it there yet. They remain unengaged with the gospel. Heaven's not inclusive in the sense that everyone is included. But heaven is inclusive in the sense that someone will be there. Did, did you note the adjectives that John used as he describes this great multitude? They're from every nation. And they're from all, all tribes and peoples and languages. Someone will be there from every nation. Someone will be there from all the tribes and peoples and languages, but they aren't there yet. So what we understand from that is that the vision John sees of heaven was not heaven as it was in his day. It's not heaven as it is even in our day, but it's heaven as heaven will someday be because someday someone from every nation will have heard and believed the gospel. Someday someone from all the tribes and peoples and languages of the world will have heard and believed the gospel, yet that's not happened yet. And that's why we're still here. If you're a follower of Jesus and heaven's better than earth and heaven's your eternal home, why didn't God just save you and take you to heaven? <laughs> well, he's left us here for a reason. He left us here with the opportunity to be a part of, of making heaven what heaven will someday be. He's left us here with a commission the Great Commission, to go and make disciples of all the peoples of the world. And because they aren't there yet, we are still here. How will you be a part of this great work, addressing the world's greatest problem with the solution that God has given us, the gospel, so the who can be there? Another question this morning, where? Where are they? Well, of course, we're talking about heaven, right? But it's interesting. John is very specific as he describes where this great multitude is gathered. Uh, no one can number them. They're from every nation, from all tribes, peoples, and languages. And he, then he says they're standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They're there in the very presence of God. Can you imagine what that will be like? To see as we've been seen, as the Bible says, to know as we've been known. What it will be like to be in the presence of the one who loved you, died for you, 
what it will be like to be in heaven. The Bible speaks of it as a house not made with human hands. Jesus simply referred to it as my father's house. My father's house. In John 14, we find him using that language. He's gathered with his disciples in what we refer to as the upper room. They're in the city of Jerusalem. Uh, they are there to, for the, the Passover feast or meal or celebration. And, and we refer to it as the Last Supper because it's the last time that Jesus would share the Passover with his disciples because later that night he would be uh, betrayed, arrested, the next day crucified. The disciples didn't know that was coming. But knowing they were in Jerusalem where they knew people wanted to kill Jesus, certainly they were wondering, what are we doing here? And they were obviously a bit terrified because Jesus addresses them that way as they gather around the table in John 14. And he says this, don't be troubled. You believe in God, believe in me. And then he says this, in my father's house are many rooms. If it weren't so, I would have told you I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come and take you to be with me where I am. Jesus wanting to assure those who felt that the world was falling apart before their very eyes spoke to them about heaven, about the Father's house. One of the challenges with three million people coming out of Ukraine is where do you put them? Where do they sleep? Where do they stay? I had the opportunity to be in a Baptist church just about 20 kilometers from that border checkpoint between Poland and Ukraine, uh, Helm Baptist. It's spelled C-H-E-L-M. Don't ask me how you get Helm out of that. It sounds like Chelm or as uh, they say, Helm. But it was interesting. The church looked, once you got inside, nothing like a church. All of the pews had been taken out of the sanctuary. Um, there was nothing on the stage that would have reminded you of a church. Instead, in the sanctuary, there were 200 cots on the stage and in every square inch of the floor. The fellowship hall had been converted into a, a, a constant dining area. In Sunday school rooms, uh, there were cots. Uh, in uh, utility rooms, they had plugged in extra stoves doing anything they could to provide shelter, a place, a home, if you will, for those who had none. Jesus speaks to us. And the world is falling apart about his father's house. Being there is the great hope that those who are in Christ have. It's the solution to the world's greatest problem. Until the who are there, however, our work remains here. Another question this morning. How do you get there? It's interesting, Jesus uses some very symbolic language, or John uses some very symbolic language as, as he's uh, describing what's unfolding before him as he looks into heaven uh, John says uh, there was a great multitude. No one could count them. They're from uh, every nation, all the tribes and peoples and languages. They're, they're in heaven standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And then he says this, they are clothed in white robes. There's the symbolic language. They are clothed in white robes. Now, do I think we'll literally be wearing white robes in heaven? Well, I, I think that's probably the case, but, but don't miss the symbolism of that. I, I tend not to wear white very often. I thought I could get away with it today because my shirt is striped and because I have a jacket on. I tend not to wear white very often because I'm not the neatest guy in the world. And if I have a white shirt on, inevitably at some point through the day, I'll look down and there'll be a coffee stain down the front of my shirt, maybe evidence of what I had for lunch. And 
Uh, I, I'm just not that neat. And, and I'm like some of the guys uh, probably on campus here in the dorms. I'm one of those guys who, if there's a shirt laying across the foot of the bed uh, or, or, or the chair in our bedroom and my wife's not around, uh, I, I might pick that shirt up and give it a, a, a look over and uh, see if it passes the sniff test. And, and uh, if, if, if it does, I'm going to think to myself, now there's no reason to put that in the laundry and watch it disappear for months on end. Uh, I, I think I could get one more day out of it, and so I'll wear it again. You can't do that with white. I mean, you can, but it's just not seemly. It's, it, it, the white shows all the dirt, and you get the ring around the collar. I mean, you, 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 white's not, not good for that because white shows every stain. The Bible says that the greatest problem of human beings, the greatest problem in the world, is the stain. It's the stain of sin, all of sin and fallen short of the glory of God. We're born dead in our trespasses and sin, and, and to sin is to be enslaved by your sin, and the reward of the wages of sin is death. It's not heaven, it's hell. As I reflect upon my life, a relevant question is, how can a guy as messy and stained as me, and I'm not talking about lunch or coffee, I'm talking about sin, be in a white robe in heaven for all eternity. This is where the gospel comes in. Yet there's a couple of people I wanted to tell you about today who, who I believe will be in heaven who have never heard the gospel. Before Dr. White charges the stage and pulls me down, let me explain to you why I believe that to be the case. One of the unique ministries of the International Mission Board is uh, our mission outreach to deaf peoples. We actually have a training school in Nashville, Tennessee to equip those who are deaf missionaries and missionaries to the deaf. Do you know you don't have to be deaf to be a missionary to the deaf? Just as you can learn the language or culture of any people group in the world, you can learn deaf language and deaf culture. The IMB uh, is a, a bit unique from most missions organizations because we have dozens and dozens of missionaries who are sharing with deaf peoples around the world. You know, there are millions upon millions, more than 70 million deaf people in the world. Very few churches or organizations are doing anything to reach them. We're thankful we are. And by the way, if you're interested in doing mission work among the deaf, go to imb.org. Tell us about yourself, about what you sense of God's call on your life. But not just mission work among the deaf. We're working all over the world among every people group that we can get to. You can go for a semester or a summer, uh, finish your degree, or uh, if you're just doing an associate degree, you don't necessarily have to have a college degree, but you can go for two years fully funded through our journeyman program if you're under the age of 30, married or single, as long as you don't have kids yet. Their career missionary paths to serve with the IMB. Uh, talk to your mom and dad. Tell them retirees can go serve with the IMB as well. Lots of opportunities to go and to serve, imb.org. One of the unique ministries is that ministry to the deaf. We had someone come from Indonesia uh, during the pandemic just before it began uh, to train to share the gospel among deaf peoples in his country uh, he finished the training, but by then the pandemic had begun. He couldn't get back to Indonesia. But wanting to not waste what he had learned, he invited a group of his deaf friends in Indonesia to join him on a Zoom meeting online. Uh, a group of them responded, and they set up the time. They had the meeting. He spent an hour sharing with them his testimony in the gospel through sign language. At the end of that hour, two of the Individuals in Indonesia who could not hear responded back to him communicating in sign language that they believed what he had shared and they were ready at that very moment to put their trust in Christ and be saved. We've connected them with a local church there where they're being uh, discipled and, and baptized. But, but that's how two individuals who have never heard the gospel because they've never heard anything, they're deaf but they've clearly come to understand the gospel has been shared with them in a way that they could. And I believe they'll be in heaven. 
until the who are there. How? The gospel. We still have work to do here. Which brings me to the last question. And that question is this. So what? So what? Now, it's not the so what that my 15-year-old daughter asked because that's not a question. (laughs) That's her way of saying, would you hush? That has nothing to do with me. So what? No, it's this so what? So what, Lord, do you want from me? I've seen into heaven as heaven will someday be. What do you want me to do now? Would you dare ask that question? So what, Lord? What do you want from me? I want to offer an answer to that question through a personal illustration. It was many years ago. In fact, my 52nd birthday is coming up on Sunday, the first day of spring. So it was many years ago that there were a couple of men who were members of a Baptist church in a small little town along the Tennessee-Kentucky state line in the mountains. They met in the parking lot on a weeknight They met in the parking lot of the Baptist church on a weeknight because it was church visitation night. Anybody ever been a part of church visitation night? They were church visitors that night. Uh, Meeting and organizing themselves, they set out to do what they'd come to do. They began to walk through uh, the neighborhoods of the little town, knocking on doors, inviting people to church. At some point in the evening, they climbed a very steep hill. And they came to the next to last house on that road before It turns up the mountain. It's too steep to build houses anymore. They stepped up on the porch of a rental property at 210 Province Street. They knocked on the door. And a young man in his mid to late 20s came to the door. I don't know if they knew about his circumstances. It was a small town. Maybe they did. Had they known about his circumstances, they would have known that at that point he was about two years divorced and that he was raising three boys on his own. I don't know if they knew any of that. What they could not have possibly known is that the four-year-old at the time somewhere in the house would someday be the president of the International Mission Board. But they knew enough to know that that young man needed an invitation to church because folk not in church need to be in church and because those who don't need the Lord still have the world's greatest problem on their shoulders and broken families need healing in Christ. Knowing whatever they knew, They invited my father to church. He accepted their invitation. I'm not sure how he managed to do it, but somehow he managed to get three rowdy boys ready on his own on Sunday, and he took us to church. He did it the next Sunday, and the Sunday after that, it soon became uh, what we did. What we found was a church family that loved us and welcomed us, shared the gospel with us, looking back on it, kind of raised us. A few years later, there's another knock at our door one evening. Dad went to the door and our pastor was standing there. He had come at my father's invitation because my older brother had been asking questions about the gospel. And dad had asked Brother Allen if he would come and talk to my older brother. He sat in the green chair in the corner of our living room and shared the gospel with my brother Lynn. My younger brother, Dana, and I, we sat in the floor and we listened in. Brother Allen got three for one that night as the three of us put our trust in Christ. We're baptized together just a few weeks later in the baptistry of the little First Baptist Church of Jellicoe, Tennessee. Oh, how thankful I am for a couple of men out knocking on doors who knew And anyone who didn't know the Lord had a problem they could not solve on their own. 
the world's greatest problem. And they cared enough to share the gospel. A pastor who came and sat in her living room and cared enough to share the gospel. Men who understood why they were there. I hope you understand why you're here. Not necessarily talking about Cedarville, although that's very much a part of it. I'm talking about if you're a follower of Jesus, why are you still on earth and not yet in heaven where everything is better? We're still here because the world's greatest problem has not gone away. And because the vision of heaven has not yet been fulfilled, we're still here to go out there. And whether it's in the community, across the country, or to the billions among the nations, it is for that that you are here. Go live out the vision and be on mission. Let me pray for you today. Father, thank you for letting us see into heaven today. Thank you for the great hope that it affords us that you, Lord Jesus, have secured for us in your sacrifice. Thank you for this group of students, for the faculty, the staff, everyone who's a part of this university, for the missional focus of this school. Uh, Lord, thank you for uh, those who have gone out from here and who are taking the gospel uh, across the state, nation, and to the very ends of the earth. Thank you for those sitting here today who will go out from here. Lord, might you find each of us always ready and willing to say, here am I, send me. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So go.